Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. We thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for what a wonderful weekend we've had, Father, in your presence. Friday night, Saturday, and this morning. Father, you are mighty. You are strong. You are magnificent. You are glorious. And Lord, just as we we drank and were fed Friday night, Saturday, let the same thing take place this morning. Lord, let us be overflowing in your Holy Spirit. Let's be overflowing in your truth. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. All God's people said, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. We're going to make it through all of Revelation chapter 4. And I was talking with Greg during service. I, say, I was like, hey, dude, we're going to heaven this morning. He said, what? You know something I don't know? I said, no, 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 no. We're going to heaven through the pages of Scripture. But uh, we're going we're gonna to look this morning at the throne of God. The throne of God. We're going to look at the what the Bible says about to be there before his, standing before his holy throne. So let's read a couple verses so I can get your minds oriented in the direction we're going this morning. And then we'll dive into my teaching. But Revelation chapter 4, let's read verses 1 through 4. It says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here. And I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, one sitting on the throne and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardis in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were 24 thrones and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their head. The title of my teaching this morning from our text is God's throne in heaven. And we'll be looking at Revelation chapter four, verses one through 11. Now, before we get into this teaching, I want to ask you a question. What is the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in life? Think about it. Uh, Exactly. We talked about that before service. I said, all right, guys, don't talk about your wife because she is beautiful. Our wives are beautiful. But what's the most, what is guys? You know, our reward in heaven is going to be the Lord Jesus Christ, is going to be eternal life. But I'm going to take it a step further this morning. I'm going to give you another incentive this morning to look forward to heaven. What is the most beautiful thing in existence in this entire universe? It is God himself. That's what I'm going to show you this morning in our text. As we go through Revelation chapter 4, John is on sensory overload. His mind is being blown away. The things he is seeing, the things that he is hearing, the things that he is witnessing, he's just like, whoa. It's, 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 it's like a euphoric high. He, he's just blown away at everything he's seeing. So please stay with me this morning, and I'm going to give you another incentive today to look to looking forward to heaven. This is, um, this is going to take your breath away. This is going to leave you in awe and amazement as we look at the throne of God. What will it be like when you first see the throne? One day you're going to leave this world. Your soul is going to leave that body and you're going to stand before the presence of God. And what is it you're going to see? What is it you're going to, it's not a complete mystery because the text, the word of God tells us some of the things that we will see. What, will, what will, we, will we be surrounded by in heaven? So this morning, I want to teach on the most beautiful thing you will ever lay your eyes on. And the most beautiful thing that you will ever lay your eyes on, you have not seen it yet. Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, he says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but one day you're going to see face to face. And it's going to be amazing. So let's take a look at it. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. The first thing I want to point out to you in verse 1 is the two phrases, the beginning and the end of verse 1. After these things, he begins the verse with. And then he ends the verse with, after these things. What you need to understand is Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 is a dividing point in the book of Revelation. Okay? Because he makes a clear distinction here. He says, after these things. What things? The church age. 
What have, we, what have we studied for the past eight weeks? We've studied the seven churches in the book of Revelation. From uh, Revelation chapter one is the introduction. Revelation two and three are the seven churches. And then he says, after these things. So he's making a clear separation. We go from the church age, and then he's going to, uh, Revelation chapter four and chapter five is on the subject of heaven. And then we're going to dive into the dark days of the great tribulation. But, but he, separ he separates these two. And this is where Calvary Chapel places the rapture of the church. Okay? Because from Revelation chapter 4 all the way to Revelation chapter 21, there is zero, nada, no mention of the church. There's no mention of Christians. It's completely void. So for the next five or six months as we go through the rest of this portion of Revelation, there's not going to be a lot of talk about Christians. There's, I mean, there's not going to be no talk about Christians. There's not going to be no talk about the church because we believe that the church will be gone before God pours his wrath out on the earth. So that's very important. He says, come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things, after these things being the body of Christ, after the church age. Verse two, he says, immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was standing in heaven. So the first thing I want to show to you, look at the first word in verse two. He says, immediately, immediately. This was John's flight time to heaven. This is how long it took him to, to leave his body there on the island of Patmos and to go into the throne room of God. It, it was immediately, uh, theostos is the uh, Greek word. It means in an instant, in a flash, in a nanosecond. How long is a nanosecond? One, one billionth of a second. That's, that's the flight time from your body to the throne room of God, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Death is just a little bump. It's just a little, a little bump in our journey. And, and the minute we close our eyes, the minute we pass away, um, the minute our soul, spirit leaves our body, we will be immediately in the presence of the Lord. It's, it will be immediately, it will be instantly. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2 says, Paul says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a man was caught up. Harpazo is the Greek word, to the third heaven. It happened in a flash. It happened so quick that Paul goes on to say in this passage, whether I was in the body or out of the body, I'm not sure. It happened that quick. It was like, and he's there, and he's standing before the throne of God. And so it will be when one, when you pass away, when death comes in this life, you will go straight into the presence of the Lord that quick. But it'll also, this also can apply to the rapture of the church. It's going to happen that quick. It's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye that we will stand in the presence of the Lord. And then he says, immediately, look at the verse 2, immediately, I was in the Spirit. Very important point there. You need to understand there's two parts of you. There's two parts of every single one of us. You have a physical body. That's this flesh, these bones, these eyes, this physical body that you move around on the earth. But you also have inside of you a spiritual being, a spiritual person. And that spiritual person on the inside of you is the one that lives forever. Okay? You know, we're going to go back. Our, our physical bodies are going to go into the tomb. And, and, and we're going to return to dust because that's what the Bible teaches. Dust, we will return. But that spirit man inside of you, your soul is going to be the one that lives forever. And when you become born again, that spirit man inside of you is the one where the Holy Spirit resides. It's, the Bible talks about this, uses the word spirit, it uses the word heart. It's that inner person. It's who you are on the inside. This physical body is not you. The real you is on the inside. You're just inside this shell of a body. And then he says... And behold, a throne was standing in heaven. Here, John has an out-of-body experience, okay? Christ takes him up, uh, as the text says, through a door into heaven itself. And what's the first thing he sees? What's the first thing he sees when he gets to heaven? He doesn't see Aunt May, who passed away. He doesn't see uh, the streets of gold, or he, he doesn't see... Um, relatives who've gone before him or the pearly gates. The first gripping reality that, that John sees upon this instantaneous 
transportation to heaven is he sees this stunning and majestic throne this before him. John is awestruck by the magnificence of this throne. It's like nothing he's ever seen before here on this earth. And whatever your imagination is of God's throne, whatever picture you have in your mind, it's a million times better. It's a million times greater. It's going to blow your spiritual mind away when you get to heaven and you see the throne of God. It's going it's to be awesome. And it says there in uh, verse 2, it says, um, and behold, a throne, it says it was standing. That word standing, it means fixed. It, it means permanent. It means immovable. It means unchanging. That's the throne of God. God's throne, a throne in general, the word throne is a place of absolute authority. It's a place of absolute authority. It's a place of absolute rule. It's a place of absolute sovereignty. God's throne in heaven, you need to understand, is he is the ruler, creator, and the sovereign Lord of the universe. He rules and reigns. Later in the book of Revelation, the Bible is going to talk about how heaven and earth flees from his throne. It is the one eternal standing throne that will never be undone. Governments shall rise, governments shall fall. Rulers will come, rulers will go. But God's throne will last forever and ever. So John is looking at this glorious, beautiful, majestic throne that he's going to describe more. But then as he's looking at the throne, his eyes, his eyes go upward. His eyes go upward. And what does he see? Look, halfway through verse 2. Halfway through verse 2, it says, And one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardis in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Now take note here, family. He's not talking about the throne. It says the, it says the one who was sitting on the throne, verse 2, verse 3. It says, He who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardis in appearance. The second thing that John sees and he's struck by is God himself. He's able, now I don't know if he's able to just, I, you know, there's some scriptures that talk about we're not able to see God because of his holiness and power. So I don't know if he's able to see his image or if it's just a silhouette, but just looking at the Lord, it strikes him. It strikes him and he is awestruck at the splendor of God himself. And what does he do? He describes him like a diamond. He describes him like a diamond. People love looking at diamonds. Diamonds dazzle us. They're, they're beautiful. They're magnificent. They make people say, wow, look at this diamond. It is so beautiful. The sparkling lights and the light refracting through it and causing all kinds of images. But here it says, uh, he was like a, a jasper stone. A jasper stone is crystal clear. A jasper stone being crystal clear, it speaks of God's purity. God's purity and God's holiness. And then it says, uh, and Sardis in appearance. Sardis is a fiery red ruby that is rich and blazing. So what is this text telling us? That God himself, God himself is spectacular and beauty and the greatest the most beautiful being that you will ever see from now to eternity will be God himself he will be God himself how many of you guys ever been to the Grand Canyon by a show of hands anybody ever been to the Grand Canyon when people go to the Grand Canyon they, they first they, they look at the Grand Canyon and it, for the first time they're in shock and awe they're like wow look at this Grand Canyon what it does is it, it produces a, a euphoric high in the, in the person's mind, in the person's heart, as they look at the Grand Canyon. But after you've been at the Grand Canyon for a couple days, that euphoric high wears off. It's going to be the same way with God, except that euphoric high will never wear off. When you first see God in all his glory, you're going to be in shock and awe. You're going to be in awe and amazement. And that awe and amazement, that euphoric feeling is going to last throughout all eternity. Brings a whole new meaning to the joy of the Lord. To, to, to know that you're going to experience this joy and this excitement 
of seeing God in all his glory. I'll give you another example. A child on Christmas morning goes in to the living room to see his presence for the first time. Do you remember that expression on his or her face? They're like, wow. They see all their gifts. They see their new bicycle. They see all their gifts. And they're just overwhelmed in joy. They're just overwhelmed in excitement. And, and they're, they're probably the happiest moment for the child year round is on Christmas morning when they see all their gifts. But then by late afternoon or the next day, the child's high is wore off and they're playing their games. Well, you and I, when we get to heaven, we're going to experience that same emotion uh, as a child does on Christmas morning when we see the beautiful throne of God. It's just going to be overwhelming and all. But here's the cool thing. Unlike the child who's all wears off over time, we're going to experience that throughout all eternity. That's an amazing, amazing truth. You know, that's why the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. We experience joy in this life. We experience the joy of the Lord in serving him. But I'm telling you right now, the joy that you experience in this life is just a nano bit compared to the joy of seeing God himself in heaven. Family, it's going to be glorious. It's worth the fight. It's worth the wait. It's, it's worth the resisting sin. It's worth serving Christ. It's worth going out and giving your life in service to the Lord. You know, whatever sacrifice you have to make to serve in God, it is worth it. One day you're gonna, be get to, you're gonna get to heaven and that joy and that excitement of seeing the throne of God and seeing the Lord Jesus Christ, you are gonna be blown away. And you, 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 you're, you're gonna be mesmerized. God in his beauty, and this is one of the points I wanna drive home, is the most beautiful being you will ever lay your eyes on. But you and I, as the scripture says, we haven't seen him yet, but we're promised one day we will. And God, in his beauty, in his appearance, um, you know, we can't create an image in our mind, because if you create an image in your mind, you're violating the second commandment, it says you shall not create a graven image. But just know this, that God in his beauty, of seeing him, he is majestic, he is beautiful, he is dazzling, he is brilliant, he is blazing, he is stunning, he is spectacular, and it's going to be awesome. He is the most beautiful being that you will ever lay your eyes on. And John is there on the island of Patmos, a political prisoner for Rome, suffering for his faith in Christ. And what joy! Why did God give him such a revelation? I believe so he could communicate this uh, awe-inspiring moment to the church that was suffering there in the first century there in, in Rome. It, this, this is what they needed in their trials and their tribulations as they were being beheaded, as they were being persecuted, as they were being put in jail. I doubt they had a lot of joy. So God gives John this vision, shows him this reality to show all the believers the beauty of who God is and the beauty of his throne. Where are we at? Verse four. Verse four. Um, and around the throne were 24 thrones. And upon the thrones, I saw 24 elders. So you have this magnificent throne that's awesome, amazing. God on his throne who is majestic and beautiful. Now there are 24 lesser subservient thrones. And who are these thrones that are surrounding? These, it says, who are the 24 elders? I believe these are representatives of the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles of the Lamb. They're representative of all the people of God, family. We are part of the family of God in the New Testament, just as the people in the Old Testament were, uh, are part of the family of God. They looked forward to the Messiah. They looked, they trusted in God. Proverbs chapter three, verses five and six was written in the Old Testament. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your understandings and all your ways acknowledge him. The Bible says Abraham believed God. It was credited to him as righteousness. They were saved just like we are saved. They trusted in the Lord and they looked forward to the Messiah coming. We trust in the Lord and we look back to the Messiah at his ministry here on the earth. So these, these, uh, 
elders, 24, now there's multiple interpretations. I found out to be the most, the one that I, I most fit to is they, is they represent the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles showing that um, we're all part of the family of God, Old Testament saints and New Testament saints. And notice it says there, um, they were clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads, clothed in white garments. What does that mean that they were clothed in white garments? That means that they had been washed in the blood of the lamb. They had been washed in the blood of the lamb. And when you go to the cross, that's what happens. When you go to the cross by faith and put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, he washes you in the blood of the lamb and he forgives you of all sin by the cross. And he clothes you in, in, in righteousness. This is what we get when we go to the cross. We get p- complete forgiveness of sin. The slate is wiped clean. Romans chapter eight, verse one says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because Jesus paid the price at Calvary and we get washed. That, remember I said a while ago, you're two parts, the, the, the physical body and the spiritual body. That spiritual man on the inside is the one who gets washed, not the physical body. You do that when you go in the shower or you get in the bathtub, okay? But the inner man, the, the spiritual person, gets, takes his shower, takes his bath at the cross. They they're, uh, says they have golden crowns on their heads. This talks about their reward for their faithfulness. So John is just being blown away, okay, family? Remember, he'd been on the island of Patmos, political prisoner. Life was rough, and all of a sudden, he's experiencing the glory of heaven. So after he looks down at the throne, after he looks up at God, what does he do now? He takes an about face. He takes an about face, and he looks behind him. He, he turns back. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He doesn't turn back yet. He looks at the throne, verse 5. Verse 5, he says, And out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So first thing we see there is the seven spirits of God. That does not mean that there are seven Holy Spirits. This is a reference back to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, where it talks about the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of his ministry. But, but the thing that grabs me in John's vision of, of the throne in verse 5 is he says, uh, there come flashes of lightning and sounds and, and peals of thunder. How many of you guys like a good light show? How many of you guys like a fireworks show? I do. Well, let me tell you, there ain't no fireworks show, there ain't no lightning show that's going to compare with the one from heaven. Now, don't misunderstand me. I, b- I believe this is a reference to to heaven and to the holiness and to the power of God. But he he uses this illustration of uh, flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder to talk about what we see in our natural world. Have you ever seen thunder and lightning light up the night sky? It's like, boom, whoa, you feel it in the ground. And uh, if, if you've ever been outside, uh, especially like out in the country where there's farmland and you see light, it just, in the middle of the night, it just lights up the sky. That's what it's going to be like in heaven. That's what it's going to be like before the throne of God. Many of us have this picture in our, in our, in our mind of all these clouds, these white clouds and this little golden yellow chair at the top and some dude with a, a, a white beard and all that sitting on top. But that is not biblical. That is not biblical. This is what is biblical. It says there's going to be... Um, lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. So if you're into light shows and seeing an awe-inspiring, amazing thing like lightning and thunder, you're going to see that in heaven. At the same time, I, I, I imagine it produced a holy fear, a reverence for God as he was standing before the throne, the holy throne of God. Because you know, we're going to see in a little bit, the angels are going to be cr- surrounding the throne, crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. But this lightning and the sounds and the peals of thunder, this is a picture of power. This is a picture of shock. This is a picture of awe. And this verse 5 is written in the present tense, meaning it's continually happening over and over and over. It power is raining down from the throne, from the throne of God. Power is literally raining down from God's holy throne. Family, you're gonna see this one day. You're gonna see this one day. 
when you step into, when Christ returns or you step into eternity, you're going to see this glorious, beautiful, magnificent throne that is just going to melt your heart. You're going to be like, wow, that euphoric high that a child experiences on Christmas morning or someone experiences when they go to the Grand Canyon. You're going to be like, whoa, this is huge. Verse 6, verse 6, our tour of the throne. And before the throne, and before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes, front and behind. So these four creatures, they're like the cherubims in Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 15, and like the seraphims in Isaiah chapter 6. What, what are these living creatures? These are an exalted order of angelic beings is what they are. They, um, after the fall, we, if you go back and look at Genesis chapter 3, the exact same word is used to describe these angelic beings that guarded um, the tree of life in the garden. They kept people from going into the garden. They, they protected people from going in because the curse had taken place. They said, you can't go no more to the tree of life. These are the same beings. Now they're guardians at God's throne. Uh, because it says their, their eyes are in front and back. What does that tell us? As they're the guardians around the throne, they see everything. They see everything. They, there's eyes, they're, they're covered by wings in the direction of God, but they see everything that's taking place around the throne of God. Verse 7, it says, The first creature was like a lion, the second creature like a calf, the third creature had a face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. So each one of them has a duty, has a responsibility, has characteristics as they surround the throne. The lion, he is strong in service. Strong in service to who? To God's purposes. Strong in service to the throne of God, to their assigned responsibilities there in heaven, just like it was here on earth, there in the garden. The second one, it says, the second creature was like that of a calf, sacrificial in service. To who? To the throne of God, to God himself. Then there was a third creature, like that of a man. These creatures, weren't, these creatures were smart. They had reasoning ability. They had intellect. The fourth creature was like an eagle, meaning that these uh, four creatures that surround the throne, they were swift to carry out the orders of God. That's who these creatures are. They serve the purposes of God in heaven. And then it says in verse 8, And the four living creatures, each of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night, they do not cease to say. And here's the chorus of heaven that you will hear. When you get to heaven, you're going to hear this, this beautiful chorus. You, you think our worship leader is great, which he is. And you think it's some other church worship leaders that are great, and I'm sure they are, but wait till you hear the chorus of heaven. Wait till you hear this angelic, heavenly choir singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard this before, but why are there three holies? I believe there's three holies for the three members of the Trinity. There's a holy to the Father, there's a holy to the Son, and there's a holy to the Holy Spirit. They cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He is El Shaddai. He is like a great and mighty mountain who is secure and strong, and we can trust in him, who was and is and, and is to come. God is eternal. You know, people, I've heard parents talk about, you know, what do I say when my child asks me, who created God? Pastor, how do you answer that question? That's, there's a very simple answer. Very simple answer for who created God. Nobody created God. He's outside the realm of time and space. Psalms chapter 90 says he's from everlasting to everlasting. He is the one who dwells outside of the realm of time and space that created everything that we see. He is eternal. He is eternal. He never had beginning and he will never have end. He is not part of creation. When people um, struggle with that thought, 
what they're doing is they're placing God in creation. Everything in creation, yeah, it, it had to have a beginning, okay? It, it had to have a source of beginning, and it will have an end. But God doesn't dwell in creation. He dwells outside of time and space. He dwells in that place that, that the scripture calls eternity. And he's the one without beginning and end. And they are declaring the truth here in verse 8. One, that God is holy and God is eternal. So when we worship, you know, we see a blueprint in heaven. Worship in heaven is declaring the holiness of God. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. If that's being sung in heaven, let's sing it here on earth. Let's go ahead and, get, let's go ahead and start practicing now for the eternal song. Verse 9. Verse 9, he says, uh, And when the living creature gives glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, um, they'll say, Worthy of you. But verse 9 and verse 10 is like a chain reaction. Verse 9 opens up, it says, And when, when what? When the living creatures, those four living creatures, when they give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, that causes a chain reaction. The chain reaction is in verse 10. When that happens, it says the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne. But I want to wait a minute before we get to what they say. But they, they will cast their crowns before the throne. You see, in this life, we're earning crowns for our service, for our faithfulness, for our commitment, for our evangelism, uh, for suffering. We, we earn, there's five different crowns the scripture talks about. But one day, even the crown that the Lord God promises us when we step into eternity, one day we're going to take our crowns and we're going to cast them at his feet. Because we're going to say, no, God, I'm not worthy. Lord God, you are worthy. True worship, looking at verse 9 and 10, true worship takes place in heaven. Creatures, the four creatures around the throne, I want you to see this, they give glory, honor, and thanks. And then after they give glory, honor, and thanks, the elders fall down and, and lay their crowns before the throne. You and I, we worship when we, le when we live to bring Christ glory. You know that? You're, you're worshiping in this lifestyle. You're worshiping in this life when you commit to your life bringing glory and honor to Christ. We honor him by placing him first. We honor him by giving thanks. And we honor him when we fall before him and we worship him in truth and holiness. And what is it they say there? Verse 11, our final verse this morning. It says, they cry out, worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things, and because your will, they existed and were created. This phrase here in verse 11, where it says, worthy are you, this was used by first century Roman generals. After a defeating a foreign enemy, they and their forces would march to Rome with the severed heads of their enemies in one hand and the spoils of their riches in the other hand. They would go to Rome, they would stand before Caesar's throne, and they would proclaim, Caesar, you are worthy. That was their job. They brought spoils, they brought severed heads from their enemies, and they, and they went to Caesar and they proclaimed uh, that he was worthy. Why? Because their allegiance in the first century, the Roman soldier, was to Caesar, and Caesar alone. For the Christian in the first century to confess Jesus as Lord, as Romans chapter 10 verse 9 teaches us to do, was a death sentence. Because there was an allegiance in the first century. That's why John is on the island of Patmos in the first place. Because he's like, no, Caesar's not Lord, but, but Jesus is Lord. Now, considering that phrase, worthy are, you, worthy are you, John here applies it to the Lord God Almighty. And that teaches us that the Lord Jesus Christ, he's worthy of all glory, honor, and power because of three things. The three things. One, it says there, uh, for you created all things, and because your will, they existed and were created. The first one, why he, he's worthy of all glory, honor, and power, is the Lord Jesus Christ is the creator. Jesus is creator. Jesus of Nazareth, 
the Son of God, the Son of Man, that lived 2,000 years ago, that walked the streets of Galilee, that died on the cross at Rosemary Grave. He is the eternal God. And please notice that they're saying this in heaven. There is no debate in heaven how the universe came into existence. Everything in the universe displays the glory and the majesty of our God. The truth be told, there really is no debate here on earth. It's just truth and ignorance. I mean, anybody with a rational mind, anybody with a brain that can think and eyes that can see, will see the glory of God in creation. This stuff does not happen by chance. You did not come from some primordial ooze or some big bang explosion. The scripture says in the beginning, God created and he displays his majesty from the, the sun that's 900 million miles away to the human eye as you look in your mirror tonight, as you're getting ready for bed or brushing your teeth in the morning, look at the human eye, look at the fascination, look at the blueprint of God in everything. The Lord Jesus Christ, he is the creator. Secondly, uh, he's worthy of all glory and honor and praise from we know from scripture because he defeated the enemy of your soul. Jesus Christ defeated the enemy of your soul. Who is the enemy of your soul? Satan. How did Jesus Christ defeat Satan? He defeated him at the cross. So when you put your trust in Christ, when you, when you put your faith in Christ, you get to experience that victory that Christ had over Satan. It's given to you when you're born again and you trust in him. You can win the battle, okay? You can win the battles that you face. There's going to be some tough ones, man. And you got to get out the sword and you got to fight the good fight. But you can win. Why? Because Jesus defeated Satan at the cross. And the greatest reason why Jesus Christ is worthy of all glory, honor, and power is because he is the one that was put up on a cross for you and I. It's by his death on the cross by his suffering at Calvary that we are completely forgiven. He is the king of heaven. Hopefully he's the king of your heart because he died on the cross to forgive you of your sin. That's the most, that's the heartbeat of Christianity. That's the heartbeat of the Bible. That's the heartbeat of the church. If there's anything that people need to be convinced of and people need to understand whether whatever church they decide to go to, whatever, whatever the one thing they need to hear, the one thing they need to understand about the Bible is not about the flood, not about creation, not, not about eschatology, but they need to understand that foundation that Jesus Christ is Lord. He gets all glory, all honor, and all power because he is the one that went to the cross to forgive you and I of our sins. And to partake of that complete forgiveness, uh, Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. You say, God, I'm sorry for my sin. Please forgive me. I turn away from the old life and I put my trust in you, Lord Jesus. It's a completely free gift. There's nothing you can do but put your trust in him. That's our message to the world is trust in Christ. Amen? Amen. He is the king of heaven. As we roll into Revelation chapter 5, we will continue our study of heaven. So we'll be in, we're in heaven this Sunday, not literally, but through the scriptures. And we'll be in heaven next Sunday as we look at Revelation uh, chapter 5. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for um, this tour of the magnificent throne of God. Father, let our hearts stand in awe of you when we consider your greatness, your power, your glory, your throne. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We magnify you. And Father, um, if there be anyone here this morning that's suffering, that's going through difficult, that's kind of down and out and depressed, I pray, Father God, that this message this morning that um, will bring them hope, will bring them joy, will help them uh, lay aside the things that are worrying them and are concerning them, and they will consider how magnificent and how glorious your throne is. And one day, Lord God, right now we see through a dim mirror, but one day we will see you face to face, and we so look forward to that day. We look forward to the day where we leave this world and we get to spend eternity 
with you, Lord Jesus, in heaven. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, Father. Amen.